46 tons of composite armor, a 125mm smoothbore gun. To the outside world, the T-90 looks like a fortress on tracks, a symbol of projected power designed to intimidate and destroy. But inside the hull, the reality is claustrophobic and terrifyingly fragile. For the three men sealed within this steel shell, safety is an illusion. They are enclosed in a machine that wraps them in protection, yet seats them directly atop their own destruction. It takes years to train a crew, months to build a tank, and mere milliseconds for both to be erased. To understand the violence of modern armored warfare, we must look beyond the viral footage of burning wrecks. We must examine the engineering choices made decades ago, choices that determine what happens when the physics of a shaped charge meets the chemistry of a catastrophic design flaw. The T-90 did not emerge from a vacuum. It is the culmination of a rigid military doctrine that spans 40 years of Soviet history, a philosophy that viewed the tank not as a fortress for the crew, but as a disposable tool of mass operational maneuver. While Western powers like the United States and Britain were developing the Abrams and the Challenger, massive, complex behemoths that prioritized crew survivability above all else, Soviet engineers pursued a different, ruthless efficiency, low profile, high mobility, and mass production. This design lineage began with the T-64 in the 1960s, a technological marvel that introduced composite armor and autoloaders, but proved too complex and expensive to sustain for a conscript army. It was followed by the T-72, a mobilization tank that sacrificed sophistication for sheer numbers, allowing the USSR to flood the plains of Europe with armor. By the late 1980s, the Soviet military was burdened with a chaotic mix of incompatible platforms, the high-tech T-80 and the mass-produced T-72, creating a logistical nightmare of spare parts and maintenance. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the new Russian Federation faced a critical choice. Their economy was in ruins, and they could not fund a revolutionary new platform to compete with Western tech. Instead, they chose evolution. They took the reliable, easily manufactured chassis of the T-72B and grafted onto it the advanced fire control systems of the T-80U. The result was designated the T-90. It was a pragmatic, cost-effective solution that saved the Russian tank industry, but it locked the modern Russian army into the architectural DNA of the 1970s, inheriting a fatal flaw that no amount of modern reactive armor could truly fix. The defining characteristic of the T-90 is its silhouette. It is small, squat, and notoriously difficult to target on a ridgeline. This low profile was achieved by a radical engineering decision, eliminating the fourth crew member, the human loader, and replacing him with a mechanical autoloader. This allowed the turret to be smaller and the entire vehicle to be lighter, giving it a strategic mobility advantage over heavier Western tanks. This system, known as the AZ Mechanical Autoloader, sits on the floor of the hull in a rotating carousel. It is an engineering marvel of the Cold War, capable of selecting the correct ammunition type and ramming it into the breech in seconds, allowing the tank to fire rapidly and relentlessly without human fatigue. However, this efficiency forces a dangerous trade-off that defines the T-90's vulnerability. In Western tank design, ammunition is stored in a separate bustle at the back of the turret, isolated from the crew by heavy, blast-proof doors. If the ammo is hit, the explosion vents outward, saving the crew. In the T-90, there is no such separation. The crew does not sit behind the ammunition. They sit on top of it. The commander and gunner are positioned directly above a carousel containing dozens of high-explosive fragmentation rounds and propellant charges. They are effectively riding on a magazine of high explosives, with only a thin metal guard separating their legs from the rotating machinery and the volatile propellant. In the calculus of Soviet engineering, the compact size of the tank was deemed worth the risk. For the crew, it means they are living inside the bomb itself. The dangers of this configuration moved from theoretical discussions to grim reality in the urban ruins of Chechnya and later on the battlefields of Ukraine. The T-90 was designed for long-range kinetic duels on the open plains of Central Europe, where its low profile would allow it to hide in the grass. But warfare evolved. The tank found itself in the claustrophobic chaos of city fighting, where threats do not just come from the front, where the armor is thickest, but from the sides, the rear, and above. When a modern anti-tank weapon, such as a javelin or an NLAW, strikes the T-90, 
It does not merely hit the vehicle. It connects with a violence that defies comprehension. These weapons often utilize a shaped charge warhead, heat. Upon impact, the explosive detonates, focusing a liner of copper into a hypervelocity jet. This stream of superplastic metal moves at 25 times the speed of sound, roughly Mach 25. At this velocity, steel armor does not behave like a solid, it flows like liquid. The copper jet pierces the steel hull like a needle through warm wax, injecting a stream of incandescent metal and shockwaves into the crew compartment. If this jet passes through empty space, the crew might survive with ruptured eardrums and shrapnel wounds. But in the cramped confines of the T-90, there is very little empty space. The interior is packed with hydraulics, fuel, and electronics. If that superheated stream penetrates the hull and touches the propellant charges stored in the carousel beneath the turret, the tank ceases to be a fighting vehicle. The laws of physics take over, and the entire structure becomes a containment vessel for a massive chemical reaction. Tank crews and analysts refer to this catastrophic failure as the jack-in-the-box effect, a term that belies the horror of the event. The root cause lies in the propellant charges used by Russian tanks. Unlike Western ammunition, which uses inert storage or blowout panels, the T-90's propellant is semi-combustible and highly volatile. When the superheated copper jet from an incoming missile contacts these charges, they do not simply burn, they deflagrate. This is a subsonic combustion that propagates through the material at explosive speeds. In milliseconds, the pressure inside the hull spikes to thousands of pounds per square inch, far exceeding the tensile strength of the steel welding. The tank effectively inflates from the inside. The turret, a massive structure weighing 12 tons, is held in place only by gravity and a ring of bolts. It becomes the path of least resistance for the expanding gases. The turret is torn from the hull and thrown hundreds of feet into the air, often spinning violently before crashing back down. For the crew inside, the event is mercifully instantaneous. The overpressure destroys the biological capability to process pain. The explosion occurs faster than the human nervous system can transmit a signal from the nerve endings to the brain. There is no realization of death. One moment they are fighting, the next they are gone, erased before the turret even begins its ascent. This is the brutal calculus of the design. The machine fails catastrophically to ensure the enemy is destroyed, but it offers zero margin for error for its operators. However, total destruction is not the only outcome. There is a fate arguably worse than immediate death, penetration without detonation. Not all anti-tank weapons use explosives. Kinetic energy penetrators, solid metal darts made of depleted uranium or tungsten traveling at hypersonic speeds, can punch through armor purely through force. As the dart enters the armor, it creates a phenomenon known as spall. The inner wall of the tank shatters under the stress, spraying the crew compartment with a shotgun blast of superheated metal fragments. This glowing shrapnel ricochets inside the steel box, shredding hydraulic lines, shattering optics, and tearing through flesh. The crew is left wounded, deafened by the sonic boom of the impact and surrounded by failing systems. And then, almost inevitably, the fire begins. Fire is the primal fear of every tanker. Unlike a high explosive detonation, fire is slow. It consumes the oxygen within the sealed compartment in seconds. Automatic fire suppression systems hiss, flooding the cabin with halon gas, but they are fighting a losing battle against the physics of combustion if the propellant has ignited. Thick, toxic smoke fills the lungs, blinding and choking the survivors. The exit hatches, heavy slabs of steel designed to keep threats out, now become obstacles keeping the crew in. They are heavy, often jammed by the impact debris, and require immense strength to open. In these moments, survival is not decided by armor thickness or electronic countermeasures, but by the terrifying calculus of escape time, a race against asphyxiation in the dark. The T-90 remains a formidable adversary. It is rugged, lethal, and capable of enduring harsh conditions that would stall other machines. It represents the peak of a specific evolutionary line, but on the modern battlefield, where drones strike from above and missiles strike from the side, the T-90 cannot escape its origins. Every upgrade to its sensors and armor is merely a layer of protection over an unchangeable internal truth. We look at tanks and see invincible iron monsters, but strip away the reactive armor tiles, the electronic countermeasures, and the propaganda, 
and you find three human beings sitting inside a machine filled with explosives. Steel can absorb the impact, the soul cannot. 